Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. During the second half of the Carboniferous period, the sauropsid reptiles began their first wave of diversification. Most modern phylogenetic studies indicate that the most basal members of this clade were the para-reptiles, an interesting lineage that first appears in the fossil record during the late Carboniferous and expanded greatly during the Permian. Once referred to as anapsids, due to the fact that many species lacked an opening in the skull, it was later found that some of these animals did indeed possess temporal fenestrae after all. Due to this so-called anapsid skull formation, it was additionally thought that turtles were highly specialised members of this group that had persisted into modern times. However, the vast majority of genetic analyses indicate that turtles and relatives were significantly more derived sauropsids, being placed as the sister group to archosauromorphs in most studies. Discounting the turtles then, parareptiles originated as small, superficially lizard-like animals, although many later forms developed into highly robust, bulky herbivores with armoured bodies and spiky cranial headgear. Nonetheless, this group shares a number of anatomical traits, including large orbits that were longer than the region of the skull behind the eyes, unusually large supratemporal bones compared to other reptiles, and the possession of a distinctive pit at the end of the maxilla. The identification of which groups actually belong to Parareptilia remains somewhat controversial. I have already mentioned the issue surrounding the clarification of turtles, but another unusual group of reptiles has been sometimes placed within Parareptiles as well, the Mesosaurs. I've covered these animals in a previous video on this channel, so I won't be going over them again in detail here. But it is important to note that some studies have placed these long-jawed swimming reptiles as the most basal parareptiles. Other paleontologists placed them as the most basal of all sauropsids instead. If mesosaurs were parareptiles, then their elongated snapping jaws would contrast quite sharply with the blunt, robust skulls of most members of this clade. Among the oldest definitive groups within parareptilia were the Aclistorhinids which were superficially lizard-like animals with large stout teeth adapted for piercing the shells of arthropod prey. Indeed, the recently described genus Carbonodraco from the late Carboniferous of Ohio is the most ancient of all parareptiles. Inhabiting the hot tropical forest that covered most of North America at this time, specifically 308 million years ago, Carbonodraco would not have appeared too different from the many other lizard-like animals that thrived in such ecosystems. Close relatives such as Colobomicta from the early Permian possessed even larger and nastier looking teeth, which seemed to have been adapted for piercing. The teeth at the front of the upper jaw were massive and caniniform in shape, giving the animal a somewhat buck-toothed and rodent-like appearance. These features would have allowed Colobomicta to prey on small vertebrates as well, including amphibians and eu reptiles. Like most members of the clade, the skull is quite blunt and blocky. Interestingly, Aclistorhinids were far from the most basal parareptiles, which suggests that there are probably many more Carboniferous forms waiting to be discovered. The most basal definitive family, the Milleretids, first appeared during the Middle Permian and were also small insectivorous animals, albeit lacking the massive teeth of Colobomicta and relatives. Almost certainly diverging during the late Carboniferous, Milleretids were endemic to South Africa and likely possess a long ghost lineage in the fossil record. The mysterious genus Unitosaurus has at times been placed as a close relative of these animals, while also being considered to have been a stem turtle. With its very wide and flat ribs, Unitosaurus would have resembled a barrel-bodied lizard and does indeed appear quite turtle-like, although such features may have been the result of convergent evolution. Beyond these animals, all more derived parareptiles are contained within the broader clade Procolophonomorpha. The exact placement of several lineages within this grouping is still uncertain, although most members were notably more specialised and bizarre than their more basal relatives. The genus Lanthanosuchus of late Permian Russia, for example, superficially resembled a modern giant salamander, and was probably semi-aquatic. Measuring about 75 centimetres, or roughly 30 inches long, it was initially thought this unusual genus was a labyrinthodont amphibian due to the flat, pancake-shaped skull and the vertical orientation of the eyes. However, the heavily ornamented and bumpy rear portion of the skull was more typical of derived parareptiles, with the animal's wide mouth enabling it to swallow anything smaller than it in a few gulps. In a world full of relatively large temnospondyls, 
It is unknown as to why this genus took to such an odd ecological niche. Another strange family were the Bolosaurids, which were also among the oldest of the parareptiles. The most well-known member of Bolosauridae was the genus Eudibarmus, from the early Permian of Germany, a tiny animal measuring just 25 centimetres, or less than 10 inches long. Eudibarmus has the honour of being the oldest known bipedal vertebrate so far found, long predating the development of similar postures in archosaurs and certain mammals. With a short round skull, elongated hind limbs, and large feet with long central toes, Eudibarmus would have been an agile herbivore, sprinting away from varanopid and sphenacodontid predators possibly running in a manner similar to that of the modern Australian frilled lizard. Several close relatives are known, which also hail from the first half of the Permian, although these are not as well preserved. The genera Belebe and Bolosaurus were both small and bipedal lizard-like herbivores from Eurasia. An unusual sister genus of Bolosauridae, the Canadian Ereptonyx, is the second oldest parareptile behind only Carbonodraco found in rocks dated to between 303 and 298 million years ago. Unlike the Bolosaurids, this animal was a carnivore or insectivore, with sharp conical teeth associated with the holotype. The most derived of all parareptiles belonged to a large clade known as Procolophonia, which produced both the most massive and latest surviving forms. There were two major lineages of these animals, with one being the small and squat Procolophonoids, while the other were the more famous periosauromorphs, which would go on to produce some of the largest herbivorous animals of the Permian. However, basal members of this grouping were still small and far more generalised, resembling insectivorous lizards. Once placed together within the family Nycterolestidae, it is now thought that this was not a natural group, but instead a grade leading up to the periosaurids themselves. More basal forms lacked ornamented skulls, and were probably nocturnal, being most common in what is now Western Russia. The most derived of these animals, and also the largest, was the middle Permian genus Ripeosaurus, with a more robust build and three cusped teeth. Ripeosaurus was probably an omnivore, which would have resembled a stocky three-foot-long lizard, with its features representing a transition toward the fully herbivorous Periosaurids. These animals appear quite suddenly in the middle Permian of southern Pangaea, with the oldest and most basal forms being large and bulky herbivores. All were heavily built, squat and bulky reptiles with broad guts, small ornamented skulls, and limbs that were sometimes positioned directly beneath their bodies. Their teeth were multi-cusped and leaf-shaped, similar to those of modern iguanas, indicating dedicated herbivorous diets. The most basal member of the family, Bradysaurus, was native to South Africa about 265 to 260 million years ago. Measuring up to 10 feet long and weighing half a ton, this slow-moving herbivore was covered in dermal scutes that aided in protection and defense against dinocephalian predators, although these were not as dense as in later forms. Another basal genus, Bunostegos, persisted into the late Permian of what is now Niger, which was a surprise for paleontologists. A stocky, cow-sized animal, Bunostegos inhabited a highly arid environment of central Pangaea, which seems to have functioned as a refugia for other late surviving species, such as large captorionids and basal temnospondyls. The genus was also notable for being the oldest known vertebrate to have walked in a fully erect stance. Some more derived periosaurids appear to have become smaller as time went on. The late Permian genus Pumilioparia was the tiniest member of the family, measuring only 50 centimeters long and weighing about 8 kilograms or 17 pounds, no bigger than a cocker spaniel. With a very wide torso formed of greatly extended and thickened ribs, this animal was protected from predators by a dense coat of osteoderms. These features, along with a partially fossorial lifestyle, led early researchers to suggest a close relationship with turtles, although the traits are now thought to have developed independently. Another small form, Elginia, was present in late Permian deposits of Scotland and China, being notable for possessing quite elaborate bony horns extending from the rear of the skull. Fully grown individuals measured roughly one meter or three feet three inches long. The most derived members of the family were massive, however, and persisted right up until the end of the Permian. The genus Pariosaurus inhabited South Africa between 260 and 252 million years ago, and was a cow-sized, low-browsing herbivore that fed on tough, poor-quality plant matter. Its very similar cousin, Scutosaurus, was native to Russia at approximately the same time. 
Measuring up to 10 feet long and weighing roughly 1,160 kilograms or 2,557 pounds, being comparable to a modern black rhino in terms of mass, Scutosaurus was heavy and its short legs meant that it could not run at any speed from predators. To defend itself, Scutosaurus had a thick skeleton covered with powerful muscles, especially in the neck region. Underneath the skin were rows of hard, bony scutes that acted as a natural form of armour to defend the animal from gorgonopsid predators. As a plant eater living in a semi-arid climate, including deserts, Scutosaurus would have wandered widely for a long time in search of fresh foliage to eat. It may have stuck closer to riverbanks and floodplains, where plant life would have been more abundant. Given that it needed to eat frequently, these animals probably lived alone or in very small herds, so as to avoid denuding large areas of their edible plants. Unfortunately, Pariasaurids and many groups of Parareptiles would become extinct during the severe End Permian extinction event. As the Great Dying more strongly damaged communities of large terrestrial animals, only a relatively small and potentially fossorial group survived into the Triassic, the Procolophonoids. Like most Parareptiles, Basal representatives were generalised insectivorous animals, although later and more derived forms shifted towards durophagous lifestyles, feeding on tough plants or hard-shelled prey. One family within Procolophonoidea were the Oanetids, which were native to the Southern Hemisphere and persisted into the Middle Triassic, with a relatively blunt skull and robust bodies with short legs. Oanetids may have resembled some modern skinks that live in dry, arid environments. Their more successful sister group, the Procolophonids themselves, were generally similar and dwelt across most of Pangaea. The most primitive Procolophonids were likely insectivorous or omnivorous, while more derived members of the clade developed bicusped molars and were likely herbivorous, feeding on high fibre vegetation or being durophagous omnivores. Many members of the group are noted for spines projecting from the rear of the skull, which likely served a defensive purpose, as well as possibly also for display. At least some taxa were likely fossorial burrowers. While diverse during the earlier Middle Triassic, they had very low diversity during the Late Triassic, and were extinct by the beginning of the Jurassic. Some of the last genera, such as the North American Hyopsonathus, possessed bizarre cranial horns and spikes, probably utilised as a form of defence, and possibly species recognition. The reasons for the decline of these animals is still poorly understood, but it is possible that competition with the diversifying lepidosaurs may have played a role in their gradual demise, with the end Triassic extinction event simply being the fatal final push. In conclusion then, despite their incredible levels of success during the Permian, the parareptiles as a whole would die out with the Procolophonids. Older ideas that modern turtles are their descendants have been proven incorrect by genetic testing meaning the clade is entirely extinct. They were nonetheless a pioneering early lineage of sauropsids, successfully developing a range of forms from tiny lizard-like insectivores to massive armoured herbivores that competed with large synapsids in megafaunal niches. In many ways, they presaged the diversity of more derived sauropsids that emerged during the Triassic. Thanks for watching everyone. The next episode will be covering the distinctive Tremarctine bears of the Americas. So until then, I'll see you again soon. Cheerio.